This is Pam from North. I love the rope here. <laughs> this is Pam from NortheastWheelsEvents.com. Ah! <laughs> At the Simeon Museum in Philadelphia, PA. And if you've never been to this museum, you've got to come in. Right in the back of us, of course, this is the fabulous GT40, 40, GT40. If you want to learn about the background of it, we just uh, recorded a wonderful presentation about car craft. This is also based, uh, the book is available. Watch for the ads coming through or check out simiummuseum.org. Uh, so let's check out what we've got with car craft and the assault of Le Mans by four. Again, this is Pam from NortheastWheelsEvents.com. <coughs> Besides talking about our favorite subject, which is racing sports cars, it's rare that we get the opportunity to talk about people who are actually involved in racing, and a particularly rare thing when, believe it or not, the United States was actually successful in racing, which is uh, something that you hardly see, sadly, throughout the whole history of of automobile racing throughout the world. Interestingly, in 1921, the Duesenberg people sent a team to, uh, to France to, for the first post-World War I Grand Prix, and we actually won a famous 1921 race at Le Mans that uh, Jimmy Murphy won in the Duesenberg. It was not till 45 years later, that's a hell of a long time, it was not till 1966 that an American car one and not till 1967 until an American car with an American driver won at Le Mans, won the world championship, and were the dominant force in world racing. And after that, a magic period of time from 1966 to 1969, America has never succeeded in comparison with the great racing teams of the world, which is remarkable since America produces more cars arguably better cars, but <laughs> for some reason, the concept of motorsport uh, has eluded us. So we have to cling on that wonderful period of time, 1966 to 1969, when America, stimulated by the Ford Motor Company and then Shell later on, uh, wanted to be an international figure in racing, wanted to win the World Series, the World Cup, the Super Bowl, wanted to be up there, where surprisingly there was very little effort before that. Now, during that magic time, um, the cars that actually started this were the 1966 Mark II, which uh, one of these, this car raced in that, but didn't finish. One of these, actually three of these came in, one, two, and three, 1966. And an even re more remarkable car from an en engineering point of view, the yep. Mark um, IV, won Sorry, the Mon in 1967 with an American driver, which was yeah. also kind of a unique thing. That, that period of time is very special. Uh, we have here today, we, uh, and we're very lucky, people who were actually involved in that effort for car craft and subsequently. And then to add to the beauty of it, we also have someone who has respected that period of time, respected particularly these, these cars, and I think that one, which is one of our favorites, so much so that he made a nut and bolt there are several nut and bolt replicas of these cars, one of which you're going to see out there. And the owner of that car, Jim Dolan, uh, may even start it up for us. And I, I doubt it, but I might even talk him into taking it around our parking lot you can, because I know you like to see cars. But that's <laughs> going to be up to Jim. So who are these people who have created history for America? Charlie Henry was um, a, an engineer, car guy, worked with Chrysler for a long period of time, but he had a magic period of time when he was with car crack. This is, we like to use the word skunk works, which were really meant uh, racing teams which were part of, affiliated, or even totally separate from the manufacturers, but took the manufacturer's automobiles and used their basic parts in a way that was acceptable to the racing organizations to make great race cars. That's what car craft was, and Charlie will tell you that story. Carl Kainhofer, a local guy, not only not only part of that team, but part of the remarkable Penske organization when they were building, right, we're starting racing right out here in the suburb of Philadelphia. Carl is here and is going to talk about his experiences there. 
And then something the technocrats will really love is um, Mike Teske uh, came here all the way from Tennessee to bring what's going to be a really remarkable uh, uh, explanation of how you take an object like that uh, and build another one, or another two, or another three, or I guess another seven? Seven. So, <laughs> and, and he's working on number eight. But I mean, it's just absolutely remarkable. For instance, that they created a whole concept of, of chassis construction for that car. Honeycomb sheets, uh, which, would, which were held together to make the tub much, much lighter than a normal tub, yet had the same tensile strength as steel, if, it were, if they were made like, of steel, which would have been appropriate for that time. This is all a wonderful story, story but I want to start with Charlie Henry, who's uh, really a hero in part of this. Now, the reason he's a hero, besides what he did, was this is a remarkable period of time. And these times come and go, and unless somebody like Charlie records it, it will be an important part of history that's lost forever. We have here enough of these books that you can all buy one and have Charlie sign it, which will be done if, when we're done talking. There'll be a break, some questions and answers, and then Charlie will be at a table where you can uh, buy these and have him sign them and keep them as a treasure because these are going to be hard to get in the future. So can we start with Charles? Thank you, Fred. Uh, I have to thank Fred for inviting me out here. This is kind of a two for one. Uh, one, obviously I get to talk about my book. And second, this has been on a, my bucket list for a long time to see the museum. Uh, kind of unfortunately up to now we've been talking about cars, but that's kind of an oxymoron saying it's uh, uh, unfortunate because you know how, guy, how it is with car guys, get them together and start talking about what you're doing now and what you were doing and how, how fast you used to be. And I learned a lot both about my book and, the, uh, and cars and racing in general. So it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, equally a pleasure to see so many people in the audience. I don't view myself as a hero. That was kind of a, a surprise. Uh, I was just a, a scribe. I worked at CarCraft from January of 69 to September of 69. I had a, an opportunity to, uh, to take that job. So I took a semester off of college and said, you know, the books can wait. This is too great of an opportunity. It was a fun thing to, to, uh, for me to do. I didn't look at it as making history. But in a way, really, well, we were making history. I just didn't realize it at the time. So I had a, a kid in the candy store attitude towards the job. And at the job, I was able to meet and get to know a lot of the engineers, the designers, the even the bean counters. They were not much to talk to, but still I got to meet them. And was able to keep in touch with them over the years. So this was not a one-person project. I had four of the original engineers to lean on for information. A couple of the management people were still available and still around. Uh, I did have a chance to talk to Roy Lund, who was the top man at CarCraft. Unfortunately, he was pushing his 91st birthday and just said, I really can't remember much about those days. I'm not going to much help, which was kind of unfortunate because he would have had a wealth of information no matter how little he's able to provide. So that's my background with car craft. Uh, I only had nine months. Boy, I packed an awful lot of experience in there and kept in touch with the other folks that helped make the book, make the book possible. Um, I apologize for my voice. It's a little shaky. I had too much coffee this morning. This is really, picture is really the beginning of car craft, per se. Uh, this is the first building that uh, they worked out of. This is the Lola, the Lola factory over in England. This is where they started to fabricate the GT40s. And it was literally in the backyard of a garage in the backyard of a house. And you can see the sign, Lola Cars Limited. It looks like a little Fiat of some sort in the background with a race car frame leaning up against the wall. That's the type of operation they had. 
When CarCraft got started in 1965, this was the very first building they had. Uh, this building was with the company from beginning to end, and this was the headquarters. And later in the uh, in the uh, history of CarCraft, at the very end, it was the engine development and build shop. This is where CarCraft ended. This was on Merriman Road in Detroit, and they had everything in there. They had all the drafting facilities, all the machining facilities, and uh, the, the work there was very extensive, which I'll show you in a little while. This is the Brighton plant. This is where they built the Boss 429s. Uh, Brighton is about, I'd say, 50 miles uh, west and a little bit north of Detroit. And it was a recreational bu uh, vehicle building. So they had the assembly line already in place. And my little, my little pointer doesn't work very well, but the lower left-hand corner where you can see the four garage doors, that was the very end of the assembly line. That's where they came off the line and went into the uh, parking lot. The entrance is all the way down at the, at the top of that little little office sticks out. And everything was done to the Boss 429s there. Then they were parked in the lot. And I think we counted there's a couple hundred cars in the center area waiting to be shipped. And in there also are a couple are several 1969 Shelby's. Shelby Mustangs, which Carcraft converted in the 1970s, and just to get rid of the leftover 69s they had. Uh, Shelby had already uh, canceled his contract with Ford and had nothing to do with it. Ford was building the cars as Fords. And uh, to sell the 69s, they had to change the carburation and the distributors and put a, an addendum tag onto the VIN on the cars. And then they finally sold them off. That 69 uh, Shelby Mustang was the only car that Ford built that went down three separate assembly lines. It went down the Rouge plant, came out as a regular Mustang. It went to Ionia, Michigan, where it became a Shelby Mustang. Then it went to Carcraft, where it became a 70 Mustang. Hmm. So just a little trivia about Carcraft and some of the things that they did. This is a timeline of car craft. There's three slides like this. The whole piece of paper is about this long. And uh, it's not entirely accurate, but it'll give you a good idea of what yeah. was going on in car craft. If you don't mind me turning my back on you, I can point this out a little bit. My pointer doesn't work very well. But all the way on the left where it says Youth Market Iacocca, that's when uh, Iacocca and uh, Iacocca and Henry Ford were talking about how do we get more people involved? How do we sell more cars? And Iacocca came up with his idea, I think basically for the Mustang, a sporty type car that, uh, that would attract the youth market, which was just starting to expand and grow. From there, in 1961, uh, it went to the Mustang One concept car. Now, all this leads up to car craft, but doesn't have anything to do with car craft right now. The Mustang Two was a little two-seater with no top, little four-cylinder engine out and back with a transaxle and you know the bare minimum of uh, accommodations. But then again, it was a concept car, so it didn't need a lot. And also about that time, Henry Ford started to get the idea to buy Ferrari. He saw Ferrari as being a, a, a definite draw for the youth market and figured that, well, if we can, rather than take the time to develop something of our own, we'll buy it and go right to market with it. And I think probably the stories of Ferrari and Ford uh, uh, discussions, shall we say, uh, is well known, so I don't need to go into that. But this is about the time it started in 1963. Towards the end of that, when Ferrari backed out of the negotiations, Henry Ford got mad at it and said, well, if we can't buy him, we'll go out on the track and kick his ass. And supposedly that's a direct quotation, so uh, I have to go along with it. 
the Mustang One came about and they took the ideas from that to develop the GT40s. That's the third circle in GT40 design USA. From there, they went up to SVO, the one goes up diagonally. SVO was Special Vehicle Operations. That went over to England and that's where they hooked up with the, uh, with the Lola company to start making the cars. Uh, the design and all the development of it was done in the U.S. It wasn't a matter of going over and uh, taking the Lola, I think it was Mark 6 or Mark 7, uh, which was an existing design. They looked similar, but as Mike told me a few minutes ago, um, if you try to describe that car, <coughs> excuse me, that car, you can say it's a mid-engine car, it's swoopy looking, it's sexy looking, it's got a transaxle. That'll fit just about any of the cars at the time. They just looked a little bit different. But they took that car and turned it into a Ford design mule and from there developed a GT40. Hmm. Uh, then it went to uh, FAV in England, which was Ford uh, Advanced Vehicles where they built the GT40, ran the GT40 production, and they started building the Mark II. Finally, FAD was sold when Ford decided they just weren't getting things done. They had, I don't know, something like 15 races under their belt and never won and hardly finished any of them. They sold off FEO, uh, FEA, FAD, I'll get it right one of these days. Uh, and brought everything back to the USA, and that's when Carcraft was formed. Uh, the way the story goes, they realized that they couldn't do the car in-house. There were a lot of problems. They didn't have the facilities. They didn't have uh, uh, really cooperation with the union. The, the unions were set up to do production cars. They weren't set up to do changes on an instantaneous mo moment, and they, they couldn't go racing. So Carcraft was formed. Actually, Carcraft was already in existence. They sent engine, a, a team of engineers out and they interviewed a lot of different car, specialty car companies and manufacturers in the U.S. Carcraft was one of the companies they visited and the bean counters decided, well, give, they'll give us the best work for the best price. And that's how Carcraft was formed. From there, they took the uh, they developed the Mach 2 in 1966. That was a uh, offshoot of the GT40, not really an offshoot, but it was similar to it. It was possibly going to be a street street version. Uh, let's see, production of AB sold uh, Ford Advanced Vehicles. When they sold it, went on to uh, they sold it to uh, I think John Wire. Yeah, John Wire and, and I think it was John Wilmond. They kept going, they kept building the GT40s. They serviced and uh, repaired them and raced them. And that was where the two extra the Le Mans victories came from in 68 and 69. It were Ford cars, but it was not Ford involved in it any longer. It gets more complicated than this. Uh, They've got other projects. In 1968, they started the Trans Am Mustang. It was a 68 coupe. And in conjunction with Shelby, they developed a car. Shelby took it racing, and that was the foundation for the 69 and 70 factory race cars. Uh, from the Mark II project in the center of the, uh, of the diagram, they started to develop the J car and the Mark IV and built the two Can-Am race cars. Uh, they went on to other projects. Other projects is hard to explain. It's better, it tells more about it in the book, but they did things like develop some hanging adjustable length uh, pedal assemblies for Ford. Uh, they started to make, it, they, supposedly they were going to make a rumble seat cougar. Uh, they did a uh, Boss 351 Bronco and a whole bunch of other little projects that needed to be done in a hurry, that needed fabrication, and they just couldn't do it internally because of various, various reasons. Ford projects, again, 
the Ford was the only customer that Carcraft ever had. Carcraft was never a division or a, 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 a Ford-owned company. It was a separate company all by itself, standalone, with Ford as its only customer. They did not take any off-the-street projects from hot rodders or, or racers. It was strictly Ford, hmm. uh, Ford work. Uh, down on the bottom line, Ford projects, Super Mach 1, Boss 429. That's the line that was uh, was Mustangs. Let's see what happens here. Okay, continuation, and it goes on. It goes on be, uh, beyond this uh, diagram. Uh, oh, we're down Ford projects, Super Mach 1. That was a 1968 Mustang <coughs> Fastback that wasn't exactly the prototype of the Boss 429, but it kind of inspired it and supported it. When you're developing the Boss 429, trying to figure out if they can put this great big engine in the car, they say, well, how do we do, can we do this? Well, I don't know, let's go look at the, uh, the uh, Super Mach 1 and see what we did there. And they got a lot of the inspiration and uh, kind of prototype work for it, but the car itself was not a prototype, it was not the forerunner of it. It just happened to be a shop car. We used to use it for grocery getting. And then that was be quite a trip. It was quite a trip too. The thing was fast. Very fast. That was another uh, benefit of working for Carcraft. I got to drive an awful lot of different cars, shuttling them back and forth between Carcraft and Ford taking it out to Brighton, bringing it back, uh, came back to Brighton one time in a Boss 429, the one that was supposed to go to Monkey Newton, Newton for his personal car. And I was always very careful when I drove these things because it, it was a privilege to me to get in this car and drive it. So I was very careful with it, but geez, you put a 19, 20 year old kid in a Boss 429 on the freeway and I just couldn't resist it. I had to see what the acceleration was like on this thing. <laughs> Stood on it, fourth gear, speedometer spinning practically, and the throttle stuck wide open. Oh no. <laughs> and my exit was coming up. So I had just enough presence of mind to turn the ignition off but not lock the steering wheel. Pulled over and stopped, got out, looked, the throttle was open. Or it was closed now, it didn't come unstuck put it back together again, got in and very carefully drove back to the shop <laughs> and told the, uh, the shop foreman, I said, Al, um, I did a bad thing. And the throttle stuck wide open. Well, I got admonished a little bit until I said, would you rather it happen to me or Mr. Newson? At that point, everything went away. No admonishment, <laughs> no record, no bad marks on my record. Everything was fine. So I. Was, I did the wrong thing at the right time and said the right thing at the wrong time, I guess is how you put it. But that was part of the experience of working at Carcraft. So from there they did put the, uh, came up with the Boss 4 to 09, 429 prototypes. And that came out of a meeting with Mr. Knudsen, who at that time was on board with uh, Iacocca about the youth market. They were going to put the Boss 429 in galaxies because it would just drop it in and Ford engineers could do that, to change the engine out and make different, different exhaust and you'd have, <coughs> excuse me, have the engine qualified for NASCAR, which was the purpose of the Boss 429 engine was to get that engine in racing. To get it into racing at the time, you had to build 500 cars. And it didn't matter 500 of what particular car. The plan was to put engines in 450 Galaxies and 50 Mustangs. Newtson liked the idea of a halo car, something that's very special that would draw people into the dealership, and then they buy a pickup truck or a regular Galaxy or a Falcon, something like that. It was a draw. It really wasn't that great of a performance car because by the time you take an engine that's designed to run at 7,000 RPM constantly around a two and a half mile circle, it doesn't work well on the street. So he ended up with a car that was a tick slower than the 428 Super Cobra jet, but it sure looked good underneath the engine hood. 
Once the prototype was approved, they went to Brighton, where they, they built them on the production line, which was really a, a throwback to the old time days of production lines. They pushed the car from station to station. There was no trolley in the floor that would pull it along. So when they finished at one station, the guys would just push it up to the next one. Also there at the tail end of the uh, diagram here is a 1970 Shelby build and then the composite Mustang. The, the composite Mustang was a proposal to keep Carcraft going. Because Carcraft was a separate entity unto itself, they had to have business coming in to keep alive. No income, no business, no car craft. So they did a proposal where they took uh, a 70 Mustang and they took the Shelby parts that were left over from uh, the Shelby program, put them, modify them just a little bit, put them on a 70 Mustang, put a 428 Super Cobra jet in it, and called it in a, in a uh, Cougar interior because it was a composite of Ford, Mercury, whatever other, other cars they pulled off, they called it a, a composite. The generic internal term for it, or the nickname, was the quarter horse. You know, a thoroughbred, a composite of a lot of parts, and would go like hell. And that was that was the end of car craft. That pro, they built two of them, program was not approved, and that died. Uh, on other projects across the top there, again, that goes back to the uh, Rumble Seat Cougar, the, uh, the Bronco, and a whole bunch of other little projects here and there, some of which we, the engineers that I worked with couldn't even remember. They said, yeah, I think we did something where nobody could remember actually building the Cougar, although it supposedly it exists. Uh, so many stories, so much information, uh, and yet there's still more out there. Even since the book came out back in June, I'm still getting, hey, I found this photograph of, of the car, or I did this, and I got a piece of paperwork here for you. Well, it's too late for the book now, but that's, that's how much history there really was for car craft. I was, I was surprised myself. Uh, the final projects that they were working on in 1970 was the Ford ESV, which is Experimental Safety Vehicle. Uh, government put out a uh, program for the uh, companies to come up with a safety vehicle that could withstand a 100 mile an hour crash and couldn't roll over and you know whatever else. Ford was the only one that came up with a car that actually looked like a car. It looked exactly like a 1969-70 LTD. Uh, although it really wasn't, and the car was never dated, it was always just the ESV. Uh, story that goes along with that from one of the engineers. Ford, the Ford vehicle passed all the tests with flying colors. One of the, let's just say, European car companies that also took part in the program <laughs> sent over a little car that he said looked like a steel egg. And its survivability was not measured by how much it collapsed, but by how far back from the barrier it bounced after it hit it. <laughs> so Ford scored with that. The car, I believe, still exists. I don't know where it is. Uh, probably in a museum somewhere. Uh, and then the presidential limousines, where they, uh, Ford did the, before General Motors got in, Ford did all the presidential limousines from the 50s on up and they all still exist and they're in the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn. But that took a lot of engineering to stretch it, armor plate it, and everything else they did with it. But that was basically the last program that Carcraft did. And the program wasn't even finished when Carcraft closed up. But a lot of the engineers from that were Carcraft employees were given jobs at Ford. Uh, some didn't make the cut. Uh, Ford employees stayed as Ford employees, they were just reassigned. 1970, Ford canceled all the projects. There are a lot of stories going around. Some of the information is in the book. It was a little difficult to come up with because a lot of the people that were involved in, in upper level management are gone. And 
some of the others that were around were kind of reluctant to talk about what happened. As one of the engineers put it, there were a lot of shenanigans going on at the management level. And a lot of things couldn't be accounted for. Some things were accounted for, but why in the hell did you do that? That was too much money. Um, it's all political. When Ford canceled the contract, Carcraft continued because it was a separate company. They took in projects, they looked for work from uh, Chevrolet, GM, I think they even did some work for Chrysler at one time. It gradually faded away until around 19, did you say 70? 1978, and it finally folded completely and went away until Mike Teske picked up the name, which was still available, and the logo, and he continues as Carcraft. Hmm. Before the, they went away, Carcraft also worked on a Boss 351. They did all the engineering work and the development work, and then Ford took it over and produced it. So Carcraft invented the car, and then that was it. That was all, all the involvement they had. Uh, Ford ended up with everything at the end, and Everybody was, it was disseminated through the company, watered down. Uh, Ed Hull, who was one of the sharpest engineers they had, had a semester of engineering classes at University of Michigan and dropped out. Yet he turned out to be the best engineer probably they ever had. Just an incredible guy. He got hired, he was let go initially, and two years later they brought him back and put him in Ford truck. Uh, Don Eichstadt, who was one of, one of the engineers who helped me with the book, uh, went with the presidential limousine program and worked on that for an additional two years. Uh, one of the other guys went with him. Several of the technicians from Carcraft went with the, with, with the limousine program or went into other things. That kind of wraps up the history of Carcraft in, in a you know, 10 minute nutshell, whatever it is I've been talking. And I hope if you buy the book, and you'll find out a lot more information about the, the whole history. Unfortunately, there's still more information that could have gone in it, but it came in too late. <laughs> so yeah. I'll put the mic down, let uh, Carl come up, talk to you a little bit, and then we'll be around later on. I haven't seen the cars yet, so I've got to go look around there. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Northeastwheelsevents.com. Make sure you check northeastwheelsevents.com, southeastwheelsevents.com, ukwheelsevents.com, and wheelsevents.com. Don't forget the Z's for all sorts of events in your area. And be sure to add your events directly onto the calendars. See you at the shows.